In every generation, a conversation has taken place between a teenager and his parents when the teenager wants to go out and hang out with his or her friends and get into some things that, as a parent looking on, we realize could lead to trouble. In every generation, the parent tells the child no, to which the child replies, but all my friends are going. And in every generation, the parent responds, if all your friends were jumping off the cliff, would you jump too? Now the scary thing is that in every generation, the parent shudders at the thought of what the real answer to that question might be. But in every generation, very often that same parent will turn right around and get involved in something that his or her peers are doing, <clears throat> which is just as ill-advised and just as potentially devastating, simply because, hey, everybody else is doing it. One of the greatest lies that Satan uses to destroy humans is the lie that says, eh, it's okay, you can handle whatever the consequences might be. After all, the reward is worth the risk, isn't it? Or is it? The truth about sin is that sin will always take you farther than you meant to go, and it'll keep you there longer than you plan to stay, and it will cost you more than you plan to pay. Or as Paul put it in Romans, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Think about that. The wages of sin is death. Always death. Not sometimes death. Not occasionally death. Not that one time out of a hundred or out of a million death, but every time. The wages of sin is death. Now, of course, we know that there are billions of sins that occur every day, perhaps every minute that do not result in physical death right away. But trust me, in every case, something dies. A child, if a child steals a piece of bubble gum from a store, it seems like an insignificant act. But to the tiniest degree, the store owner's dream of retiring early dies because that child took a piece of candy without paying. If a husband cheats on his wife whether or not she finds out, the man's self-respect dies immediately, and probably to a degree the respect of the person he's cheating with dies also. But his self-respect dies, if only a little, until the guilt of what he has done slaps him in the face when he looks at his faithful wife. And as he continues to look at her day after day after day, knowing what he has done, the reminder of his guilt that he sees in her, even the trust that she places in him when he knows he's not worthy, becomes a thorn, becomes a source of irritation until he can no longer stand to look at her, not because of anything she's done, but because of the weight of the guilt that he has over what he has done. <clears throat> Every sin results in some sort of death. If an employee is caught stealing, his or her boss trusts him or her, and his confidence in him or her dies, a little bit if not altogether. Unfortunately, we live in a world that has become accustomed to things dying, a little bit every day. We are in danger of becoming conditioned to expect things to die. We don't expect anything to last. And as a result, we have become what I call a throwaway generation. We use things and we use people until they're no longer useful to us. And then we just cast them aside. The result of this is that relationships and even people become less and less valuable, less and less valued, and seemingly more and more expendable. 
we need to take heart to what Jesus said in Matthew 5.22 when he said, But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, which is to mean you worthless thing, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. It's obvious that Jesus doesn't want us to view one another as expendable or invaluable or unimportant. Several years ago, I was out at a local store buying some things to celebrate uh, my anniversary with Karen. And as I checked out, the young lady at the register noticed what I was buying and made the comment, looks like somebody's having an anniversary. And I said, yes, that would be me and my wife. And she, she asked, well, how long have you been married? And I said, 28 years. And she looked shocked. Her eyes got wide. And she said, 28 years. My goodness, that's a long time. How in the world did you manage to stay married that long? And without thinking, I just responded by saying, well, we laugh a lot. And we did. Life is too short to go through it being down in the mouth all the time. So we do. We laugh a lot. And we, we find things uh, humorous in, in whatever situation we find. But I, I thought about it later, and I thought, you know, I, can, I really missed an opportunity there. If I could go back and do it again, what I'd say to that young lady is two things. First, Jesus. Jesus is the third strand in the cord of our marriage and he is what holds us together when everything else seems to be falling apart and the second is determination we don't give up on each other we don't see one another or our relationship as being in any way disposable we didn't get married for as long as it seems to work we got married for life we committed to one another at the beginning, and we meant what we said when we said, until death parts us. Now, in this passage in Ephesians 5, Paul writes to the Christians in Ephesus and gives them some practical advice regarding how it is that they should live in the middle of a crooked and perverse generation, much like the one in which we live, today. His con he contrasts the ways in which those who follow the desires of their physical bodies live against those who follow the instructions of the Holy Spirit. And he admonishes them this way, as we read in the Passion Translation. Ephesians 5, beginning at verse 15. So be very careful how you live, not being like those with no understanding, but live honorably with true wisdom, for we are living in evil times. Take full advantage of every day as you spend your life for his purposes, and don't live foolishly, for then you will have discernment to fully understand God's will. And don't get drunk with wine, which is rebellion. Instead, be filled continually with the Holy Spirit, and your hearts will overflow with a joyful song to the Lord. Keep speaking to each other with words of Scripture, singing the psalms with praises and spontaneous songs given by the Spirit. Always give thanks to the Father God for every person He brings into your life in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And out of your reverence for Christ, be supportive of each other in love. Now in this passage, Paul offers eight pieces of advice that will help these new Christians to be successful in their spiritual journey through life. And these suggestions will be just as helpful for us today as they were for those Christians 2,000 years ago. So let's walk through these eight suggestions. And allow me to paraphrase, if you would. The first one is, don't be an idiot. Think about what you're doing. Socrates, who lived hundreds of years before Christ, was wise enough to say that the unexamined life is not worth living. When was the last time you sat down and evaluated even what you are doing, let alone why you're doing it? 
I can't tell you how many times Karen and I have been, heard someone trying to explain how they got themselves into some messed up situation say, I never thought, and we want to say, stop right there. That's the problem. You never thought. As John Lewis was growing up, especially as he approached his teen years and all of the pitfalls that can go with that, we always encouraged him whenever his friends were talking about doing something to ask himself, what is the worst thing that could possibly happen if I do this? And then I would say, remember, because you're my son, that's going to be you. Now, we said this more times than I can count, and I believe some of it sunk in. And he turned out pretty good in the long run, and in fact, I'm, I'm quite happy and pleased with the way he turned out. He's a good man, and uh, I have all, all the confidence in the world in him. So we need to think about what we're doing. Don't, don't be an idiot. <laughs> don't just live life and respond like uh, an animal to whatever stimuli happen to come along in a given moment. Think about what you're doing. Think about what could happen. Think about how it affects others. Think most importantly about how it affects your relationship to God. And is this something that you want to be doing, as Mom used to say, when Jesus comes back. The second piece of advice is to make the best use of your limited time. Now that's this comes from so many different sources. We hear it time and time again, especially at things like graduation ceremonies. You know, make the most of each day, seize the day, carpe diem and all of that. But Paul goes on to say, make the best use of your time because the culture in which we live is evil. Now, that can be taken to mean do all you can as, mu as quickly as you can to reach as many as you can with the truth of the gospel while there's still time, and we can and should take it that way. But how else do we make the most of our limited amount of time? Well, very importantly, and probably most basically, we do so by making time to spend with God, by reading His Bible, by studying His Word, by praying to Him, by listening to him through silence and meditation, uh, by spending time together with other believers in fellowship and in study and in worship. And I submit that there's really no such thing, when you look at it that way, as a Lone Ranger Christian. <laughs> we need one another to, to be encouraged and to make the best use of our time. I feel confident in saying that because in John 17, when Jesus was praying his high priestly prayer, he prayed that the Father would make us all one through his Spirit. And he instructed his disciples to love one another as he had loved them. And he said, if we love him, we will keep his commandments. Now, if you love someone... You're not going to avoid them like the plague, although that expression has lost some of its punch in the last 18 months or so. But if you really love someone, you're going to want to be with them, and you're going to want to be there for them in times when they need you. You want to be there to encourage them, to support them, to pray for them, to learn from them, and to grow in grace and wisdom and knowledge of the Lord with them prayer and Bible study, and yes, even fellowship and worship, are all what John Wesley called means of grace or avenues of grace by which God extends his grace to us and then through us to others. And so we move on to the third piece of advice in which Paul says, to avoid being foolish, seek to know and to do the will of God. We are told that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Essentially, the fool has bought into Satan's deception that there are no lasting consequences for sin. It's an outright lie. 
In fact, that's the first thing he said to Eve when he asked her, has God truly said you can't eat from any tree in the garden? And Eve said, no, just this one. He told us that on the day that we eat of it, we shall surely die. And Satan says, no, you won't. God's lying to you. When it was Satan who was lying to her. You shall not surely die. Hmm. There aren't any consequences for disobeying God. And that's what he tells people every day. Unfortunately, many of us listen. The foolishness of this approach to living, unfortunately, again, will only be fully obvious after it's too late to make the necessary changes. If you have to be filled with some kind of spirit, Paul goes on to say, then be filled with the Holy Spirit, not alcoholic ones. Think about what Paul described as the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, tenderness or compassion, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now ask yourself, how does alcohol affect the way a person is able to demonstrate all of these traits? And it should become obvious why Paul offers this piece of instruction and advice. Then he says, to speak to one another with scriptural songs or psalms and spiritual songs and hymns. In other words, don't just give people advice shooting from the hip, so to speak, but trust in the scriptures and in the collective wisdom of the saints. There is a, a huge push going on around the world to uh, minimize the importance of denominations and established religion and so forth and organized religion as some people call it and the, the implication is that if it's organized and if it's established then it's somehow evil or restrictive but there is value in the accumulated collective wisdom of the ages when we decide to go out and live life on our own spiritually speaking just relying you know on what we get from the word of god there's a very real danger that we may misunderstand some of something in that word of god or we may overlook something in the word of god that that someone else has already figured out that's the value of the collective wisdom of the ages speak to one another with scriptural songs with psalms with spiritual songs and hymns and and share the collective wisdom of the church down through the ages with one another he says don't just sing to one another but but sing to god <laughs> one of the most destructive traps in worship is sprung when we stop focusing on god and focus either on the accolades that the leader receives or the warm fuzzy feelings that we get or don't get as a participant when we forget that it is God who is the audience in our worship times and that we are the actors giving him the praise that he alone deserves when we focus on ourselves and how the worship makes us feel or the way other people make us feel when we are trying to lead them in worship. We're focusing in the wrong direction. We are 180 degrees off. When we forget that God is the only person who deserves to be pleased with how things went, and not even one of us is the object, or not even all of us collectively. It is God who is to be pleased in our worship. When we sing, we sing to Him. When we pray, we pray to Him. When we praise, we praise Him to Him. When we worship, we worship Him. Not us, not our feelings, not our musical tastes. We worship God. He is the focus. He said, give thanks to God always for everything. Now, that's easy to do when everything is going well. But what about when things don't go the way you wanted them to? or expected them to, or even prayed for them to. Can you thank God from the heart when that loved one doesn't make it? Even when you poured your heart out 
in prayer that they would? Can you thank God when you lose that job you loved and really needed? Can you thank God from the heart when your child gets sick or when your house just burned down or when your entire town was wiped out by a flood or tornado or hurricane or an earthquake or some other natural disaster? Or worst of all, when that driver cuts you off in traffic and then drives so slowly that everybody behind you starts passing you. That's when it's not so easy to give thanks to God. But Paul said give thanks to God in everything. We don't know how God is working behind the scenes. We don't understand his wisdom. We don't understand why he allows sometimes difficult things to happen in our lives. Uh, perhaps he is trying to use us to change the situation, or perhaps he's trying to use the situation to change us. But we need to be thankful to him regardless. Even when, as my wife likes to remind me, that, that light that always catches me, catches me once again. She says, you don't know what God is protecting you from. And she's right. I need to be thankful even then. And the last thing Paul tells us is to submit to one another rely upon one another out of reverence for Christ. This may be one of the hardest exhortations because it flies in the face of our Western self-made man, self-sufficient, lone ranger, I've got this mentality. We don't even want to ask others for help unless it's absolutely necessary, let alone to submit to others by letting them advise us or even lead us. But Paul says to do this out of reverence for the Lord. Do we remember that he submitted himself to death, even the death of the cross for our sakes? How he humbled himself and in response how God exalted him and gave him the name that is above all names? Whoever would climb higher in the kingdom of heaven must bow lower before his or her brothers and sisters. Jesus said, and the greatest one among you will be the servant of all, in Matthew twenty-three eleven, This is perhaps the hardest of all these exhortations to carry out because it involves that, that four-letter word humbling. <laughs> Oneself in the sight of others. But that's exactly what God is looking for because we're told time and time again in the Bible that God brings down the high and the mighty and he humbles those who are exalted, and he exalts those who humble themselves. Now think of all this in light of our discussion at the first about how we, we tend to devalue others because of this throwaway culture in which we live. The Christ-like believer does not see others as disposable, but as Paul said in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even the death on a cross. And we can never forget Jesus' golden rule, in Matthew 7:12, where he said, So in everything do to others what you would have them do to you. This, For this sums up the law and the prophets. Now there's an awful lot of spiritual truth in this brief passage from Paul. And some of the best advice for how to live a successful Christian life is found right here. Let me summarize once again. Don't be an idiot. Make the best use of your time. Seek God's will. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Share with one another the scriptures, the psalms, and the collective wisdom of the church. And when you sing and worship, sing to God, not to people. Give thanks to God for everything and rely upon and encourage and support one another and humble yourselves before one another. Become one another's servant. 
good advice for all of us, and I hope and pray that we can all apply it to our lives as we move forward. Would you pray with me as we close? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us today through your servant Paul. We thank you for what it speaks to us in our present situation, in our present generation. There are so many times, Lord, when we need to be reminded of these things. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to take these truths now and apply them to our lives, to live them out and to allow them to continue to transform us, to make us more like you, even in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation. This world needs to see someone who can truly live out their faith. And Paul's giving us some good advice right here on how to do that. Help us, Lord, to remember, to recall, and to apply these things to our lives. And may you receive all the glory for any good that results. Meet the need of every person watching and listening today. Help each one in the journey in which they are engaged through this life and help us all to draw closer to you and closer to one another as we do. And may you be glorified in everything we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for watching. I hope this has been beneficial to you. And I hope you have a great week. And I hope I get to see you soon. Take care now. Bye-bye.